Welcome to Dora Burrito. My name's Jenny and behind the camera there, that's Kitty. Hello. And we're the Nachos interns here at the Arboretum. And for today's video, if you think our backdrop looks a little familiar, you actually will be right. We're revisiting one of the sites we actually visited in a previous video. So a couple of weeks back, we did a quick video on the native tree loop here at the Arboretum. And we're actually back here today because there are a couple other trees that we haven't had a chance to meet yet that we wanted to show off. So that's what we're going to be doing today. And if you love native trees like we do, we definitely recommend checking this part of the Arboretum out. But what you can also do is for a resource, check out our website because you can order our native trees, leaves, biodiversity sheet and it's wonderful reference, quick reference when you're out and exploring for IDing all sorts of native trees, which is lots of fun. So without further ado, let's jump right into our native trees. If you're walking in our native tree loop, you might notice that we have a wonderful signage here. So native trees of Ontario, it tells you what type of tree you're looking at and a bunch of cool information about that tree. So keep an eye out for these signs as you're exploring. And this sign right here tells us for this tree behind us that we're going to meet, it's a balsam fir and balsam firs are awesome. But balsam firs can look very similar to Eastern hemlocks, which can get tricky. But there's a bit of a secret to telling them apart. If you guys want to get a little closer to the leaves, we can show you the easiest way, I think, to get a difference between these guys and Eastern hemlocks. So if we look at the needles of balsam fir, can up close look very similar to Eastern hemlock, right? These nice flat needles. But if you look on the underside needles and look really, really close at where it attaches to the twig, you'll notice that balsam fir, their needles attach with a small round disc that kind of looks like a ball. So balsam firs have ball-like attachments on their needles. So that's a kind of a quick way to tell the difference between this and Eastern hemlock. you might notice that balsam fir is a pretty impressive tree, a species of tree. They have that very distinctive shape where it tapers off to a very narrow point right at the top, kind of like a church steeple. A lot of times they tend to retain their cones as well that stand straight up on the tree. So that's kind of neat. But beyond all that, balsam firs tend to be a very nostalgic species for a lot of people because they're kind of like the classic Christmas tree tree. If you smell some of their needles, especially when they're crushed, they smell very distinctly like the winter holidays. They have that very Christmassy smell to them and they actually tend to hold on to their needles for a very long time after they've been cut, which is another reason why these guys make very popular Christmas trees, which is kind of neat. So the Arboria may not be the only place you've seen a balsam fir before. So that's kind of neat. But you know what? It's not the only tree we have here at our native tree loop. There are lots of trees to meet. So why don't we mosey on down to our next one? Next up, we have, our sign tells us, a white spruce. And you look at the needles of the white spruce. These needles look very different from the hemlocks and firs because these needles actually have four sides to them. So they roll very easily between your fingers, unlike a hemlock or a fir with those flat needles. And these guys have pretty short needles, white um, spruces, but if you look at these kind of branches, you'll notice that their needles have a bluish kind of green tinge to them, which is kind of distinctive for them. And among the spruces, 
cone length, believe it or not, is actually a really important feature for ID. So white spruces tend to have cones that are anywhere from three to six centimeters long, though I don't see any cones specifically on this tree. Um, next time you see a spruce, that's one thing you can look out for. And these spruces, not only are they very, I think, popular with us, but they're also very popular with lots of wildlife too. For example, porcupines, we actually have porcupines that live in Arboretum, which is lots of fun, but they love spruces. White spruces tend to be a bit of a favorite food for them. And sometimes if you're walking by a white spruce, if you look up, especially at the top, you might notice porcupine damage. And what it looks like is all these little scrapes off of the outer bark where the porcupine's been chewing away at it. Another good clue that there's a porcupine around is, especially in the winter, if you're by a white spruce and you look on the ground and you notice all these little brown lumps that are shaped kind of like a cashew and maybe all this pee in the snow, all this yellow snow without any footprints around. Well, those are actually produced by the porcupines as well. So those little cashew-like nuggets those are porcupine scats and the pea with no footprints around is because the porcupine is actually getting rid of its waste going to the bathroom from way up high in the tree so that's also a good clue to look up if you're near a white spruce to check for maybe a prickly cool little critter now white spruces are also really important not only for wildlife but for industry as well, believe it or not, this species is very important for uh, the paper and pulp industry here in Canada. So really neat tree all around, definitely a good one to keep an eye out for. But it's not the only tree we have around. So why don't we actually pass things off to Kitty and see what tree she wants to show us. Yeah, so we're gonna go a little bit further down the trail and see what else we can find. So come follow me. So this beautiful grove of trees right here is actually large tooth aspen. And this is a really awesome tree. They grow really quickly and they're pretty short lived, but they're really, really important in a forest, especially after maybe a burn or a clearing because once they pop their heads out of the ground and they grow up into these beautiful trees, what they're gonna do is their roots will help retain the soil uh, and the moisture in the soil as well. And the leaves as they grow up are gonna shade the ground down below and that's gonna help other plants come up in the forest as well. So a really, really important tree to have in a forest uh, and to help other plants grow up in a forest as well. So that's really, really awesome. But large tooth aspen is named for their leaves. So let's take a closer look at their leaves. So here is the leaves of the large tooth aspen. And if we are looking at a leaf like this, we could use uh, different words to describe it. Of course, this is one entire leaf. So this is an entire leaf, not a compound leaf. And we can look at the leaf margin here. So the edge of the leaf. All right, so we are looking at leaf margins. Different leaves of different tree species can have different leaf margins that you can use to help identify them. Of course, we can have leaves that have very smooth uh, leaf margin. We can have leaves like maybe oak leaves that have lobed, kind of wavy leaf margins. And we have large tooth aspen and leaves like this, which have what we call tooth margins. So all these pointy bits along the edge of the leaf here, these are called teeth. And this a species actually has very large teeth along the leaf margin. So that's why this is called large tooth aspen. So it's named pretty appropriately, a pretty fantastic tree. And not only do we love the tree for its beautiful leaves and uh, appearance, but a lot of animals also love this tree as well. So things like moose and rabbits and a lot of other critters like that love to come and eat the buds of this tree. So all around is a pretty good tree to have around. So next time you're walking along our trail here or even out in your own neighborhood, keep an eye out for large tooth aspen because it's pretty spectacular.
All right, let's keep on going and see what else we can find. to the jack pine just like our sign says and jack pine is a pretty amazing tree let's go get a closer look at its cones we see lots and lots of cones all over the branches let's get a really good close look at them so this is what the cone of a jack pine looks like you can see it's a little bit curved. Sometimes it curves up towards the branches. But what's really unique about the jack pine cone is that it's all closed up. Can you see that? These cones are all closed up and none of the seeds are exposed. And you know what? It is not going to open up until it experiences something like a forest fire. So these cones have actually evolved to be sealed completely with the resin until maybe something like a forest fire comes and burns maybe the whole forest around it down. And that heat from that fire is actually what's going to cause these cones to open up. Now, for, of course, you might hear this and think, that's pretty crazy. Why would I want a forest fire to just raise everything down? Well, it actually makes a lot of sense if you think of it from the tree's perspective. When this tree grows up from this little seed, it wants to have lots of room and lots of resources to grow into a jack pine, of course. So if a forest fire were to come along and sweep away all the plants around it, that means that it can make the soil really nutrient rich and it can give this little seed from this cone lots and lots of room to grow because all of the other surrounding plants are gone. So that can actually be really, really handy. So heat from that forest fire will actually cause the, these cones to open up and the seeds to be exposed. And that's how these guys grow into a whole new tree. Now, of course, that seems a little bit extreme. So sometimes we can see these jack pine cones open up on a really, really hot summer day as well. So we don't always need a forest fire uh, to see these guys open up. But it's a really, really cool adaptation to help the species survive. So I think that's super awesome. Now, of course, with the jack pine, you might be wondering how to identify this species from other pine species. Well, uh, the answer is to take a look at its needles. So let's go take a look at the jack pine needles. These are what the needles look like and a really good tip for identifying jack pine versus other pines is to look at the number of needles in each cluster. So each of these are one cluster and we take a look at just one cluster here you can see that there are only two needles. So jack pine has two needles per cluster whereas something like a white pine will have five and other pine species will have different number of needles as well. Jack pine has two needles per cluster. Now this can get confusing with the Scots pine which also has uh, two needles per cluster and Scots pine is actually a non-native pine species that's been introduced here in Ontario so you can see them around but the trick between identifying between Scots pine and jack pine is to look at the needles in the cluster. So take a look at this. This jack pine here it has needles that stick outwards in a V shape just like this. Scots pines will actually have needles that twist around each other together. So they won't have needles that look like a V like this. So by taking a look at needles, you can know right away that this is a jack pine. And of course the cones can give you a clue with that as well. So that's pretty awesome. And these are just some of the native trees we have here in our native tree loop. And it's really, really important to protect trees like this and these different plant species in our environment because they are super important to the world around them. For example, jack pine stands, jack pine forests are some of the last nesting sites available that will be used by the Kirtland's warbler. It's this tiny little bird and it's highly endangered. There's very little of these guys left 
and they really rely on jack pine to nest in and raise their young. So if we got rid of all jack pines, then they will have nowhere else to go. So having trees like this around, having a huge diversity of trees and protecting our native species is a really, really important way into safeguarding all the different types of life forms we have in our world and that we share our space with. So that's really, really awesome. And if you want to protect trees like this, some of the things you can do are very simple. You could do it even in your own home. You could do things like turning off the lights uh, when you leave the room to save energy. You could take shorter showers uh, to conserve water. All these different things and supporting your local conservation groups that have conservation efforts to preserve a species like this is also really important. For example, at the Arboretum, we uh, not only grow trees like this and protect them here, but we also have a lot of conservation initiatives that happen here as well. So all these things are really, really important. And I hope that by learning a little bit more about our native trees today, you appreciate them a little bit for what they are. And I hope that inspires you to get out here and learn a little bit more about the world around you as well. So thanks so much for hanging out with us and we'll see you next time.